Hello all you minders out there. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. Today we're going to look at this Crescent Watercolor Board. Now, I saw this, first saw this at Hobby Lobby. Uh, it kind of surprised me. I, I just was walking by and did one of those double takes and it's like, huh? Uh, I've never seen this before and I know that different companies have made watercolor board over the years and I've tried some in the past and uh, what I had tried was terrible. This kind of caught my eye because it's 100% rag. Uh, that's cotton. Um, and, you know, anything that's 100% cotton will catch my attention and I'll, I'll, I'll want to review it. So I immediately bought them. This is a pack of three boards. They're extra heavyweight boards. As I turn that on its edge, that may be out of focus, but you can get an idea how thick it is. Now, the other factor coming into this is that it apparently seemed, and this also was a surprise, I kind of found out by accident, that Arches has quit making their watercolor board. I hadn't looked around for it, but I used to be able to get it at Hobby Lobby and just about any art supply store. I think one of my links in one of my videos turned up to be dead or no longer valid and somebody called my attention to it and wanted to know where to get it and as I started looking I can't find Arches watercolor board anywhere so I'm presuming that they have stopped making it. Anyway that's kind of a bummer because I love Arches watercolor board. I got some here. This is the uh, hot press and this is the the cold press. So that m even more intensified my interest in these to try to find a a good replacement. These, like I said, this is an 8x10 prepackaged. They, they come in lo much larger sizes up to a big 20x30 uh, sheet. And if you're not for familiar, Crescent makes all kinds of boards. They're most famous probably for their matte boards. They make the, the black boards, uh, other types of art boards, illustration board. So I wanted to give these a whirl. Now, I don't know if you could see the texture here at all. Um, their cold press, the Crescent cold press, is much smoother than the Arches cold press. So that's neither here nor there, it's just notable. I've seen this almost as smooth as some hot press papers. Now of course the Arches hot press is super smooth. I don't have, didn't pick up any of the hot press Crescent. I know it's available. I've not seen it on Amazon. I don't think I saw any at Hobby Lobby. But also let's take a look at the, at the sides. Look at the difference. This is, uh, Crescent calls this an uh, extra heavy weight. And I think that's neat, being able to paint watercolor on a heavy board like that. The arches was sufficient in terms of wit and heaviness. This is the arches here. But I still think it's kind of interesting to have a wider width like that. All right, so just one further word about watercolor board. It is just a board with watercolor paper adhered to the surface. I know that may seem kind of obvious, but uh, it is not the same as illustration board, so be aware of that. Illustration board is different. It does not use watercolor paper. It's more of a mixed media surface. And a lot of times illustration board, uh, which while it can be and is often used by uh, illustrators and artists for watercolor, it can't take the same amount of water and water punishment that real watercolor paper can take. So just note that when you go to buy board if you're interested in buying board don't pick up illustration board you're going to probably be disappointed it may do unexpected things but watercolor board is actual watercolor paper adhered to a board surface so i'm going to take this eight by ten piece and we're going to do a little impromptu spontaneous landscape i get requests to do those a lot and i haven't done one in a while so let's go for it all right so i've got my crescent board taped off here i'm going to start with this inch and a half silver black velvet flat and we'll just see what happens. Now first of all let me show you something I've been trying out. I'm probably going to do more of these and try different formats. Uh, this was done with the waffle flower swatching stamps and I thought how cool it would be to uh, as I do paintings that are limited palette and this is going to be limited palette. I might do some color story swatch cards that I keep just to remind myself of some interesting color stories or color stories I tried. So this is sort of the color story for this painting. And I'm still experimenting with those stamps to get the right format. But this looked pretty cool. It looks like it would work pretty well. This is a little 2x2 two two individual color swatch. Then I used what Waffle Flower had as the uh, value stamp. Just used a portion of it to show what each of these colors was like 
mixed with neutral tint. So this is a three color limited palette with neutral tint and then I showed what each of the colors did when mixed with each other. So pretty neat. So Prussian blue, quinacridone violet, transparent orange iron oxide and neutral tint. This is all M gram. I think I'm going to start with the transparent orange oxide. I'm not going to pre-wet the paper. Sometimes I pre-wet the paper. I'm not going to this time. I'm going for a vertical. Most of the spontaneous landscapes I do or horizontal I thought eh, let's try a vertical one this time. I'm just going to let my brush play and dance you've seen any of my uh, spontaneous painting videos before you know there's just uh, it almost starts off as an abstract with, with very little planning. Let's bring a little of that quinacridone violet in and I do have in mind maybe this is some trees a stand of trees so we'll see And the idea again is just to be very almost abstract to begin with. Don't try to render anything. At least that's what I try not to do. Now I'm going to get some spray in here. See if I can get it to do some interesting things. Maybe I'll get the paint to run that way. Alright, let's get those drops to go back the other direction. Just, you know, it's just sort of playtime. I'm using the orange iron oxide and the uh, Prussian blue up here to kind of make some greens. I'm already seeing some really interesting things emerge. I'm going to pull a, a different spray bottle. This just gives me coarser droplets. So far, this crescent board is doing what I expect it to do. We'll see as we get in a little more to rendering the uh, details. Let's get some more of that orange iron oxide in here. Orange iron oxide is a lot like one of my top favorite colors, the red iron oxide. It's just a little orange, as you might expect. As we get some interesting things happen, I'm just going ahead and maybe making a few little vegetative things. I'm just going to blot my brush out here too. Pick up some of this excessive runoff. I think maybe now I'm going to pull in a smaller brush. We'll go to a number 10 round. I'm going to mix a more of a distinct green I think. I'm just going to touch. I've got some of these little spray droplets down in here and I'm just going to touch see what happens. We've got a few more droplets here. This is all about emerging shapes, emerging values where you're just letting watercolor paint. I'm getting little rivers in here that it's going to be cool to do something with, I think. If you see something that you think is emerging as a, as a watercolor shape, you can coax it a little bit. Like, this is a lighter value, so maybe I want to go ahead and start modeling that contrast now there. Maybe do that here. I want to break up some of this line down here. I mean, who knows? You know, some of this stuff down here could look like roots hanging over rocks. I'm not yet sure what I'm going to do with it. I'll start bringing in some neutral tint now just to get some dark shocks of contrast. And as this dries, the water flows less and less. So I can start modeling it. Little by little. Since the ground looks like it's kind of forming in here, maybe I'll go in and just 
sort of go ahead and plan for a more distant sort of line of trees and foliage back there. You can see where that last spray of spatter that I did is creating some little uh, back mini background droplets. I love that. I absolutely love that. That droplet technique is cool because a lot of times it can paint all the foliage for you and you don't have to do a thing. Just maybe go back in and and add some contrast. I'm working with some contrast here that I see. Sorry for the glare, but And strengthening that. I have my paper on a slight angle, maybe 10 degrees, 15 degrees, something like that. So a lot of stuff is gently running to the bottom, and that's fine. I, uh, it actually helps on a landscape because shadows tend to be at the bottom of things. So uh, that's kind of a thing you can work with. Again, I still don't know what I'm painting other than it's a landscape and I, I'm starting to pick out areas of contrast because I think it might turn into something. It really is that that nebulous and unplanned. I like this passage of light contrast here that's going. So I want to protect that. That gives me some highlight. Maybe even go in. If you add a little water, you can do sort of a controlled back run. Push back some of that pigment. It needs to still be damp for that to work. Normally you don't want to do this because uh, that is a background. If you're trying to get a smooth wash, it'll show, but um, it's, it's like painting with water. And while it's still damp, if it's still damp enough, you can. it's almost like adding white in places. get it wet and then you can lift a little bit. If nothing else these spontaneous landscapes are great for practice, practicing techniques. Spatter, wet and wet, intentional backgrounds, you know all that kind of good stuff. Add some more droplets here. Let the upper part paint itself a little more. Alright, so I think I'll let this dry and we'll come back after it's dry and see what we can do with this. Well, it's always exciting to get into the detailing of these and I, I get so many ideas. I felt like this really wasn't going to work very well as a vignette. So I, I'm just glazing in uh, some light color and you can also see me enhancing some contrast between a background color and a foreground area to make it look like underbrush. But there's some more glazing, and I'm working towards sort of a distant mid tree line, and later you'll see me add a distant tree line. Here I'm popping in some uh, more underbrush foliage using the colors that kind of emerged as, in the wash. I'm trying to make sense. There's some more contrast detailing. I'm trying to pull some edges out of that. Now here you're going to see 
all of a sudden this takes shape and this is something I love to do over darker areas is pull out branches and tree trunks because it immediately pushes those darker areas back and lets the lighter areas come forward and I just oh, so love doing that I think it's such a cool idea this looked like those shapes at the top look like the top canopies of maybe some pine trees so that's what I'm doing just kind of weaving those tall trunks into the foreground, behind the foreground, and up into the tree canopy above. I love long, straight, narrow tree trunks. They add such a neat sort of linear design element to a painting. And uh, I'm just adding some edge detail to that foliage. That's the best place to add tree foliage detail rather than throughout is try to add it on the edge or where a contrast edge is. So now this is all starting to make sense and I can much more easily decide what I want to enhance. As I mentioned a minute ago I don't think this is working as a vignette so I'm going to go in you'll see me in various ways kind of start knocking back the white areas. Pulling out more underbrush foliage shapes here, detail. Just logically uh, meld with what shapes are already there. And this sky uh, just needed to be very slight, misty, and overcast looking. So it's neutral tint with just a touch of quinacridone violet. M. Graham's neutral tint has a slight violet cast to it already. So. I thought this worked pretty well and then I'm carrying that wet and wet wash over to the left. I need to extend those trees off the top I think. So I'm going to wet and wet daub in a little bit of that gray green color. Filling in more of the white space that I think is a little bit too stark. I like the way that the eye comes up from the bottom right across that foliage is slanted and then turns makes a slanted turn to the right up into the sky so sort of a zigzag zag pattern I always try to make some sort of leading eye composition and just to sell the tree line a little better I added in those distant tree shapes no just adding branches just a few detailed branches not many I like the way that those tree shapes, those foliage shapes at the top, and then the trunks I added, I love the way it kind of ended up with a majestic sort of look. I always like it when these spontaneous pieces have almost a fantasy feel to them. Here I'm scrubbing. I always like to test a new paper with a scrubber. And it did great. It did just great. Any paper, including good quality cotton paper, will pill. And this one did. The real test is what happens after. As I mentioned this earlier in the video. When you go to lay a wash back over that, um, it should just act as though the paper had not been scrubbed. And on most pulp paper, you can't do that at all. You'll just get this horrible mess. But this did real well, and now I'm filling in this white area. Started out with spatter so it could have some texture. Now I'm using clear water to kind of connect the dots. And I will eventually just kind of dot and glaze in color to kill a lot of that white. Since it's not going to be a vignette, that white doesn't make a lot of sense otherwise. It's a little too stark. So we're just knocking it back making it look like a, a very light patch of foreground. And I'm really happy with this, really happy with the color scheme. All right, so I think for now I'm pretty much done. What I'm gonna do, I think, is take the tape off. And as usual, I will sit with this for a day or two and decide 
quick changes or tweaks to make. I think maybe I'm going to touch up some areas after I've looked at it for a while. Maybe up in here. One of the things I really liked about this color scheme is these misty gray greens. It's, it's, I really like that. I, I'm always on the lookout for sort of neutral greens and I like this a sort of overcast misty day feeling where these uh, greens which is just a combination of, of the Prussian blue and the orange iron oxide um, produce these these greenish neutrals very very happy with that I love beautiful neutrals interesting neutrals I like the way the sky turned out uh, which was basically a neutral tint with just a tiny bit of quinacridone violet so yeah the board is great. Um, I don't think it's quite as robust as Arches, but I think it's every bit a quality cotton paper. Where I did some uh, scrubbing and lifting, it pills a little easier than Arches, but all cotton papers pill eventually. And the issue is, is when you add a wash back in to an area that's been scrubbed, what happens to it? If it's pulp paper, it usually just looks horrible. Here, I still even though I scrubbed and peeled up some of the paper, I still got a nice even wash going down on top of that. Very pleased with this watercolor board. So far, so far I would recommend it. And I'm happy because uh, I hate that Arches stopped putting out watercolor board. All right, thanks everyone. I appreciate you watching this review and spontaneous painting. Thanks for liking and subscribing. Thank you so much, patrons for making this channel possible with your support and I will see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.